Excellent. All right, welcome to PyCon. Uh, this is your first tutorial, it must be, because this is the first tutorial at PyCon. So I, I got to chat with some of you before we got started here. Uh, we have some very mixed backgrounds today, which is always the case with a tutorial like this. Some of you have done Python before. Some of you have written code before, but you've never done Python. Uh, some of you have not written code at all. Uh, now, this tutorial was originally intended for folks who've never written a line of code, never even seen a line of code. For many of you, that means it's going to be a little bit slow at times. Also, for those of you who are brand new to coding, you are in the right place. This will be a little fast sometimes, partly because many people in this room have written some code before. Uh, so there's no way we can please everyone at all moments. If you're a little intimidated, if it's a little slow, that's just gonna be the way things are sometimes this morning. Uh, so this place that I'm in, does anyone know what this is called? I'm actually typing code right here. Yeah. Yep. Python interpreter, that is a name for it. Anyone ever heard another name for this? The REPL, that is another name for it. Anyone heard another name? Terminal. Terminal, that, ooh, yes. That I am in a terminal in the Python REPL and in the Python interpreter, which is sometimes also called the Python interactive interpreter. Anyone heard another name? IDE. IDE. Uh, this one isn't technically an IDE, though I like that one because it is something you see embedded in IDEs. And in fact, later on, you might wonder whether I'm using an IDE. Python prompt is another one I sometimes hear. Python shell. Code editor, ooh, this isn't a code editor yet, but we will see a code editor. I like that one. And the reason is, this is, it's funny because we're not at our system prompt. I'm gonna exit Python here. I'm now at my system prompt. My system prompt, if I open up terminal on Linux or Mac, if I open up command prompt on Windows, this is my system command prompt. I can do things like change directories, go up one directory, change into, oops, into this directory. Apparently I have something from PyCon last year. I can list this directory. There's nothing in this directory, so it's empty here. This is my system command prompt. When I type Python or Python 3, either one works on my machine. On Windows, sometimes you have to type just PY. It's different things on different machines. I'm now in the Python REPL, Python Interactive Interpreter, the Python Prompt, the Python Shell. There are far too many names for this place that I am at. Uh, Melanie in the back of the room there at some point said that these three little greater than signs look kind of like the back of an alligator, I think, which is a, a reptile. I think alligators are reptiles. Yes, they are reptiles. Alligators are reptiles. So this is the Python uh, reptile. There you go, the Python REPL. Uh, the Python REPL, that's the way you can remember those three little greater than signs. If you see those, that's where you're typing code. This is basically an interactive sandbox. We're able to type Python code, immediately see results. It's not a code editor only because it does more than, well, it actually doesn't edit code. It allows you to write code. You can't really change it. I can, I can hit the up arrow and I can run code again but I can't change code I've already written. So it's, it's very, very interactive. It's a little sandbox where we're writing our code, seeing results. Uh, anyone want to guess, or maybe you think you know what REPL stands for, REPL? Yes. Yeah, people either tend to know all four of the letters or they know none of them because most of us, you don't need to know what REPL means. You, you just know it's called the REPL. Uh, it actually describes what it does. Python is currently reading. It's reading what I type here. It's evaluating or executing what I've written. I'll say evaluate, either one was fine though. And then it'll print whatever the result of that thing is, that line of code I've typed, and then it loops, meaning it just does the same thing over and over. So, you know, go back to step one in a sense there. So step one, read, evaluate, print, and the loop. All right, this is going to be very interactive today. Who thinks they know the answer to this when I hit enter? Error. Error, great guess. There are no wrong guesses, by the way. We don't know what we're doing. Error is a perfectly good one. Two, 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 ooh, that's a good guess. Four, that's the correct answer in this case. 
I wasn't tricking you this time, though I like those ideas. I am going to be tricking you. Uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Python, you know, it obviously can do math. It is a programming language. It can do lots of things. As we type here, it's reading. When I hit enter, that's what makes it finally evaluate what I've, what I've written there. It prints out a result, and then it loops, meaning it waits for more. Anyone know or want to take a guess what this thing does? What might it do? Yep. Yeah, this is exponentiation. It's raising something to a power different from this. What's this? Yeah, for those of you who've done maybe MATLAB or you've used a calculator on your computer or, you know, graphing calculator maybe, it's just multiplying. Star star, raising something to a power, multiplying two by itself ten times. What about this? What's your guess? What might we see when I hit enter? What are the options? Possibilities? It could be a value error. That's going to be a very big number, right? Two by two by two, I mean... We all learned, if we hadn't before, what exponential growth is like during the pandemic. This is exponential. This is a very, very, very big number. So it could be an error. It isn't. Python can represent a number as large as we like. It has something called big integers. This is 2 to the 10,000th power. I don't know how big this number actually is, but it scrolled off my screen, as you can see. Uh, they get bigger and bigger as they need to get bigger, which is interesting. They just take up more memory as needed. So we're in the Python REPL here. Um, I'd like you to play with the REPL. We're going to take a very quick break now. I know we're only a few minutes in, but I, I, want, you to, this, I want you to get practice with this. The reason I want you to, to write code yourself right now is you do not learn by putting information into your head. Anyone know how you learn? Yeah, there's a phrase everyone says, you learn by doing, right? The reason doing is important, it's not actually the doing that's the important part, it's the, the memory retrieval. Active retrieval is the important part. The fact that we're trying to take something that might be in our head and take it out of our head. Uh, so it's important that we actually write some code to, to learn some things. So I'd like you to bring up the Python REPL on your machine. The way you can do that is open up terminal or command prompt and type Python 3, and after you've done that, I'd like you to try out some exercises. These exercises are on a website that we're working on today. Ooh, I am not on the Wi-Fi, even though I put up the Wi-Fi password. I'm just going to type the URL for the website and hope it works. Uh, so that URL there, you can go to the website, click on the very first one, pycon2023.pym.dev, and then click on the REPL over in that sidebar there. Click on the REPL. And that web website will stay up online afterwards, so if you're watching the recording later, it should still hopefully exist on the Internet. Uh, I am now going to wander around the room, along with Melanie, who's in the back of the room. And, oh, uh, what I'd like you to do, I'm going to give you a few minutes here. Just a few minutes to play around in the REPL. I want you to try to type 4 plus 7 in the REPL, see what it does, and then try to do the other things that are at the very bottom of that page. Just a couple ideas for playing in the REPL. If you get done with all the things in this first section here, actually, no, if you manage to even open up the REPL, type something and see a result, please put a green sticky, a green sticky note on the top of your computer. Excellent, some of you have already done that. If you're having trouble, please put up a red sticky. All right, I'll be wandering around here. All right, uh, for the folks on the recording, I want to note a, a problem that multiple folks are having here that I forgot to mention. Uh, I'm also going to increase my font size here. Oop, that didn't quite work. Increase the font size over here. There we go. Uh, if you were on Windows and you say, I know I installed Python, but when I type Python or Python 3, it opens up the Microsoft Store. What's going on? 
when you install Python, there is a checkbox that says, do you want to add Python or Python 3 to your path? This is on, on Windows when you install Python from python.org. You probably didn't check the checkbox. That's OK. I didn't tell you to. Uh, what you can do instead of typing Python or P Python 3 is on Windows, you can type PY. It's short. It doesn't work on Mac or Linux, although it does for me, because I have a special alias installed there. Uh, type PY, and it'll launch Python. So every time I type Python or Python 3 today, if you're on Windows, type PY instead. If Python or Python 3 works even though you're on Windows, excellent. That's great, too. Uh, the reason is the Microsoft Store has their own Python that you can install. It competes with the python.org. Sometimes the two don't realize the other one's installed. All right, I see a lot of green stickies, which is excellent. Uh, I want to ask you, why are we using the red stickies? You want to take a guess. I'll ask a different question, actually. When you have a question you need help, what do you usually do? Yeah, what you were just doing. You raise your hand. What is it difficult to do while you're raising your hand? Type. type. Right. I want you to be able to type even if you have a question and no one's able to answer it at the moment. So the red stickies are to passively indicate, I have a question. You know, could, no, no rush, but come help me when you have a moment. Uh, so I'll be wandering back around. For those of you who have red stickies up, uh, I'll get to you in just a second. We'll get back to talking about the REPL and playing with Python in just a moment. All right, uh, so I would like to move on here. I want to ask you, oh, you can put down your green stickies, by the way, and your, your red stickies. Uh, when I'm up here, I'm talking to you, uh, feel free, you don't need to stick up a sticky to ask a question, by the way. Feel free to you know, raise your hand or even just shout something out maybe sometimes when it seems appropriate. What do you think will happen when I hit enter? Error? Yeah, maybe unless it's a variable. So that's something we're going to talk about in just a moment here. Uh, by the way, mine's, my name's Trey. It's nice to meet you. Uh, I'll be typing my name a lot because it's fun to use your own name when you were learning coding. Yeah, we get an error, a name error. There is not a variable called Trey. We're going to work in variables with just, in just a moment. But the thing I'm trying to do is represent characters. Anyone know how I can do that if you've done programming before? There's a type of thing that we often use. There's numbers. And there's the other thing, the two most common things you see in programming. Strings, yeah. We need a string. So you can put double quotes around something to make a string. Uh, do you think I could put single quotes? What's your guess? Do you think there's a difference between double quotes and single quotes? Maybe. In some programming languages, there aren't. In some, there are. I'll just tell you the short answer in Python is there isn't. There isn't, except if you want to represent single quotes inside your string. So if I wanted to say, I don't know, what do you think will happen here? Yeah, Python might not know what, where's the end of the string. We get an error, invalid syntax. I could fix it by using double quotes. Anyone know another way to fix it? Yeah, you can use a backslash before a quote to say, I'm escaping this. Typically, though, since we have both single quotes and double quotes, it's pretty rare to have strings that have both of them. So you just switch the quote you're using. If you prefer one, you need a single quote or a double quote, you switch to the other. Uh, another question I want to ask you. What do you, what do you think might, what are the possibilities? What might happen when I hit enter here? What are the options? We might see an error, always an option. Always a possible option we hit enter. We might see an error, what else might happen? Get, yeah, we smoosh the stuff together somehow. Maybe we'll get PyCon and 2023. So we get back a string of PyCon 2023. What other type of thing could we get back? Oh, a number. We could get back 2023 or zero or something else. We could get a number. We could get a string. We've seen numbers and strings at this point. Uh, we could also get an error. In Python, in most programming languages, you get this concatenation thing. You're taking two strings, adding them together. You smush them together. In Python, you actually do get an error which is unusual. It's one of the few programming languages where a string plus a number is an error. You have to explicitly convert that number to a string. There's a stir function. We'll talk about functions later. Or if you're just writing it out yourself, you do this. Now, this is a little bit silly because we could also just write the string out ourselves. Notice there's no space here. 
We'd have to put the space in ourselves if we wanted a space to be there. Uh, so we're going to play with strings just a little bit at the REPL. Again, just a few minutes here. This will actually be just a few minutes this time. I know it took us a little while to get up the REPL before. Uh, play with strings. So on the website, we are under strings. At the very bottom of the page, string exercises. Try strings out in the REPL for just a few minutes here. I'll be wandering around. If you, if you have a question on anything, stick up a red sticky. Oh, and once you've tried anything with strings in the REPL, put up a green sticky. All right, so a couple folks asked about the timer that I'm using here. Uh, yes, this is written in Python. Countdown, if you, if you have ever installed a Python package, I'm guessing most of you haven't since you're brand new to Python. Python 3-m pip install countdown CLI. It'll be on the recording. You can write it down if you'd like. You don't need to do that right now. It will globally install on your machine that little countdown script if you ever need a countdown timer for some reason. It's great for teaching. <laughs> uh, who found something interesting out? Yeah, what did you discover? Yep. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if there was a typo involved there because it shouldn't be an error. So you said double quote plus double quote comes out as 23. Yeah, so it might have been a, a, a typo there. But this is interesting on its own, the fact that, you know, there's no numbers involved here. We're, we're just concatenating strings. Anyone else find another interesting thing? Yep. Right. Yeah, a couple folks found this one. Uh, what does this do? What do we get? Right. This is called self-concatenation. So in Python, you can multiply a string by a number. You get that string that many times. Now, it doesn't have to be a single digit. Anyone try something bigger? Or maybe you can take any string you'd like and concatenate it to itself lots of times. Now, this seems really silly, right? But it is actually sometimes useful. When might this come in handy? Sometimes you want one character in a string over and over, for example. You want a string that has, for example, something I've done often when teaching. I want 80 zeros on my screen to see whether my font size is big enough. It's an easy way to check if the projector's in the right, the right mode. Yep. Right, this is a great question. So some programming languages, Perl is one example. Concatenation and adding numbers are two totally different things. Because in Python, we've seen plus. What does plus do? There's two different things we've seen it do. What does it do with numbers? Yeah. Adds them. What does it do with strings? It smushes them together. It concatenates them is the fancy word for that. It's really just a fancy word for smushes together or gluing things together, I guess. Plus does both, depending on what objects it works. Now, this is something you'll see a lot, not just in Python, but other languages, that plus often does both things. Perl, you need to use a period to concatenate. You need to use a plus to add. Two totally different things. So they've, they've actually decided those shouldn't be the same symbol. In Python in particular, it's actually pretty common to see one symbol overloaded for multiple different purposes. For example, multiplication. We've seen multiplication for two different things. You can multiply numbers. Can you multiply strings? Anyone try this? What's your guess? When I hit enter, what do you think we'll see? What could we see? Could always be an error, right? Could be an error. Could be two, 10 times. Could be something else. Turns out it's an error. But you can multiply a string by a number, right? We just saw that. So string times a number, that does a different thing than number times a number. So it's very common in Python to have one symbol do different things depending on the types of those objects. And those objects can usually control what happens there. So when I typed tray before and we said it didn't work, 
Somebody said, but if it was a variable, it might work. How do you think you make a variable? If I wanted to say, I have a variable x, and its value is 4. x equals 4. So who's done algebra before? Who liked algebra? A different set of hands. <laughs> I actually liked algebra. It was one of my favorite mathy things. And I think it's because I got exposure to programming around the time I got exposure to algebra, just a little bit of programming. And I liked the fact that they felt similar, but felt similar in ways I couldn't quite say, how are they different, how are they similar? I just knew they were similar in some way. One very big way is they both have variables. So x equals 4, we're assigning the value of x to 4. Now, this is different from in math, where we say, well, we have some expression we need to solve for x. You know, x equals x plus 3. This doesn't solve, there's no solving for x here. What does this do? Any, yeah, this uh, assigns x again to what value, do you think? Whatever x was, which was 4, plus 3, so it should be 7. So because I'm in the REPL here, I type an expression, I hit enter, I get the result of that expression. Notice when there's an equal sign there, I'm doing an assignment, there isn't a result. It's just empty. So that's one of the expressions in Python where Python doesn't see this as having a result. So if I may be you know, packing for PyCon, I've got two pairs of socks isn't quite enough at PyCon. I mean, the sponsors are generous at their booths, Socks are not so, so readily available. Shirts, you could come to Python, PyCon with one shirt. There are lots of shirts here. Uh, you probably do not want shorts this year. Let's say some, something to wear. Um, this here, socks equals, there's nothing after it. The REPL's not printing anything out. There's no result of this. But if I say socks plus shirts plus pants, and I hit enter here, what am I going to see? Yeah, add 2 plus 1 plus 3, we get 6. So assignment, from the REPL's perspective, doesn't have a result. Pretty much any other expression, you, you see it printed out there. All right, again, we're just going to take a couple minutes here. We're going to try out some variables in the REPL. So just two minutes this time. And then we will finally be making a Python program after this. I promise we'll actually make a working Python script. Got questions during these couple minutes here? Stick up a red sticky. If you create a variable from the REPL, stick up a green sticky on your machine. All right, I know that was very quick. Uh, some interesting things that we found. So if you make a variable, uh, let's say it's x is 2. I hit enter here. We see that x is 2. If I say x plus 2 and I hit enter, I see 4. What is x? Yeah, this is, it's not a trick question. There will be trick questions. It's still 2. How do I change x if I want it to become the result of that? Yeah, I need to say x equals. So this is a very common thing you'll see in Python, not just with plus, but with lots of operations. Lots of operations in Python give you a new thing back, but they don't change the object. We have two types of change in Python. There's changing a variable, and then changing the value that variable happens to be pointing to. Uh, we're not going to get into the fact that in Python, variables and objects are two distinct things, but they are. And I'll, I'll link you to an article on that later. Uh, but it's, it's a big and scary topic you mostly don't have to know about your first couple of years of using Python, because Python typically pushes you in the right direction of reassigning variables when you need to reassign them. All right, we are going to be making our own Python programs here. So what I'm going to do here, by the way, what you're seeing with this split screen situation I have going on, which you probably don't have on your machine, uh, I'm using something called Tmux, Terminal Multiplexer. It allows me to have up one terminal, and in the same window, physical window on my machine, another terminal. I happen to use a text editor. It is a very confusing text editor. Anyone want to guess what it's called? <laughs> Vim, Emacs, I like these confusing text. There are multiple confusing text editors. The one I'm using is Vim. So I'm using Vim. I do not want you to use Vim. Uh, something nice about Vim, though, is that I can show it on the screen easily at the same time as my code editor. So when you see something that looks like this, where it says greetings.py, it may be complaining about something, there's some line numbers, this is my text editor. You might have Visual Studio Code. You might have Notepad++. You might have Sublime Text. Who has a different editor installed? 
edit? Oh, oh, G-Edit, yep, or B-Edit, or uh, there's a lot of them with that name, yep. Emacs, it's also PyCharm is another one. That's, a, that's kind of an IDE, that's a bigger one. Uh, so I'm using Vim here. Doesn't matter where you write this code, though. You're going to make a file called, ooh, I misspelled that. There will be a lot of misspellings today. Uh, greetings.py is how I'm going to make this. And I'm going to type in here a string, hello world, and I'm going to save this file. Now, right now from the Python REPL, if I type Python 3 greetings.py, anyone want to guess what might happen? We haven't tried this before. We get hello world, that's one option. What's another option? We get an error, always an option. What's another option? Nothing, nothing. we see nothing. Any other options? So when I hit enter, I get an error. It says invalid syntax. Why? Anyone want to take a guess? That's a good guess. In the wrong directory. Yep. Yeah. This is, so this is a very common problem. Uh, the answer here is that there are two places you can run code. There's the Python REPL. There's your system terminal, your system command prompt, your system shell, your system prompt, whatever you want to call that thing. I'm in the Python REPL. I can tell that within those three greater than signs here. I can exit the Python REPL. There's a function called exit. You put two parentheses after it. Hit enter. I'm back at my system command prompt. Or depending on how you launch Python, you might exit might not actually work. It might close the window. Uh, but if you bring up on Windows your command prompt, or on Mac and Linux, your terminal, this is where I want to be. Now, I see a dollar sign. That means I'm in my system command prompt. But I'm on Linux. Mac, you see a dollar sign typically as well. Windows, you typically see C colon backslash greater than, or some kind of greater than sign with something before it. This is my directory name. So greater than sign, dollar sign, whatever it is, it's at the beginning there. I can type python3 greetings.py. Now, I want you to guess now, this is actually how you run a Python program or Python script. It's Python, file name, we have to do it from our system command prompt, not from within the Python REPL. What do you think might happen now when I hit enter? What's your guess? Nothing again, always an option. Could also be an error. Could print hello world, yeah. Nothing. Why did nothing happen? Yeah, we didn't print anything, but I, didn't, I wasn't printing before. I mean, if I type, let's go into the Python REPL and I type hello world, why do I see hello world? Yep. Nothing's being outputted, yeah. So, is it, yes, it's not the full answer there, but you're absolutely right. Up here, nothing's being outputted to standard out. Something is here. Why? I didn't ask it to do that. Yeah, so the REPL, read, evaluate, print, and loop, it is printing out the result of this expression. Now, it's printing out the programmer readable representation. If I use the print function, it's built in the Python, we'll talk about functions in just a moment. Print, open parenthesis, something, close parenthesis. There's no quotes. So this is showing the user readable, the human readable representation. Not that programmers aren't humans, but you know we want to see things that other humans might not want to see, like those quotes there. We need to do that in our program. So at the Python REPL, there's P in the name. It's printing the result of every single evaluation. In a Python program, nothing gets printed unless you ask it to print explicitly, or unless you run a function that's going to ask it to print. So you, we need to tell it, or ask it here, to, to print out hello world. All right, so we're in our Python program. Now when we run it, oop. Got to run it with python3 greetings.py, hit enter. It prints hello world. So that took us a little while, but we finally made hello world. It's just one line of code in Python. But we've got our first Python program here. So I would like you now to try to make your first Python program. It can be hello world, though I actually have two other recommendations on the website. Uh, each of them involves downloading a file called rand.py.
I'll show you what RAND.py has in it real quick here as you download it on the website there. And I'll, I'll also put up here where we are on the website. And again, that's pycon2023.pym.dev uh, under scripts. And we are at script exercises, very bottom of the page there. Uh, so that RAND.py file, it looks like this. It's got in there import random. We haven't talked about import yet. Random.randint, one and a hundred. What could I do if I wanted to see the value of x here? What's your guess? Yeah, print x. Let's see what x is. So we'll run python3 rand.py, and we see x printed out. It's, it's 60. Who thinks it's going to be 60 again? Yeah, it seems like there's randomness going on. So you can play with this, see if you can figure out what it does, and see if you can figure out how to make a six-sided die roll. So make your own program called die or dice, or whatever you'd like to call it. On the website there, there's some instructions. Uh, there's another exercise after that for a meditative breathing exercise that involves figuring out how to stop doing something for a couple seconds and start doing it again. Uh, when you work through the first exercise, you make a random roll of a dice, put up a green sticky. Uh, if you need some help, put up a red sticky if you have a question on anything at all. So not done quite yet, but a couple notes for uh, folks at home, some of the issues we're having here. Uh, when you are running your code, you're trying to launch your program, if you're in the Python REPL, to get back to your system command prompt, you can usually type EXIT, exit, open, close parenthesis. Also, you might sometimes be in a different directory or folder. So wherever you saved that file, you need to get into that directory. So you can use the CD command to change directories. There's also a shortcut on Windows, which I unfortunately can't demonstrate here because I'm not on Windows. In Windows Explorer, you can go up to the top location or URL bar, click on it and type CMD and hit Enter. It launches the command prompt in that directory there. Um, what did you learn? Anyone find anything unexpected? I know there were some glitches and unexpected things in particular editors or IDEs or some folks who were in the browser found interesting things. Yep. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So uh, what was said there was instead of Python 3 rand, that didn't work. You have to put rand.py to actually get it to run, which is interesting because on Windows, sometimes you can also just type rand or rand.py, and it will run. But if you put the Python 3 before it, it doesn't. So depends on your operating system, but whenever you're typing it this way, you've got to put the full file name. That's a good observation. So let's do this first one together. The meditative breathing one I know is a little bit bigger. We may take a look at that one together later. Uh, this first one here, rolling a die, what did you do to modify this to make it like a, a dice roll? Yeah, change the number. So this first number one is a good one. But yeah, change 100 to 6 there. So I called this rand.py here. Let me rename this file to, actually, I'll, I'll copy this file, I guess, to die.py, because we're rolling a single die. So if we need a dice roll, we've got a dice roll. Rolls a random number from 1 to 6 there. So, so far when we've been using Python here, we've been doing things entirely within the Python process. We haven't looked at any files. We haven't asked the user any questions. We've only been outputting things. Uh, for those of you, I know at least a couple of you have taken an, a Python tutorial at some point before. How can you prompt a user to ask them a question? Anyone know? There's a function in Python that's built in. I know a couple of you have probably seen. Yeah, so there, this function, it's not called prompt, though that would be a nice name for it, to prompt the user. Uh, instead, we're asking the user for input. 
And actually, before I talk about that, I want to talk about what functions are real briefly here. I'm going to start up a new Python REPL. So we've already used a function. What function have we used besides input? Print. Yeah, print. We've been printing things. So print takes one argument, or you can even give it multiple arguments. An argument is these things that go in the parentheses. So a function has a name. After it, you put parentheses. What happens if you don't put parentheses? Anyone ever tried this before? What's your guess? What might happen? Yeah, we could get an error. Always a possibility. What else might happen? Nothing. See nothing at all. Maybe it'll print nothing. Yep. Get a description of the print function. That's an odd guess. I feel like maybe you've done this before. We do. We get a description of the print function. The reason is, in Python, everything is an object. We've got a name. That's a variable. Functions aren't any different from variables we make. Now, they're different in the sense that there's a function object. Functions do a thing that a string doesn't. A string doesn't do a thing. It stores things. It's got some characters. Function does a thing. The way we use this, the way we use a number, maybe we add the number, maybe we multiply the number, lots of ways to use it. There's one way to use a function. What's the way to use a function? There's a verb I used a moment ago. What was the verb? Call. You call a function. Now, it's not the only verb, but it's... So there's just one thing you can do. You can call a function, evaluate a function, execute a function. We call it with parentheses. Put print, parentheses, you give it whatever you'd like to give it. Now, if I put nothing in those parentheses, your guess is right. It does nothing. Well, sort of. It prints out a new line because print always puts a new line at the end. There's also a function called help. We can pass print to help to ask for help on the print function, which is a little weird. So help, in parentheses, print, we're giving it the print function. And it tells us print takes any number of arguments, that's what that little star thing means there, which we haven't explained and I won't explain. That's just a special syntax in Python. There's an optional sep and end and file and flush. We mostly don't care about these, but we could actually make it not print a new line if we wanted to. Then it really does nothing. So arguments in Python, there's two types of arguments. We'll mostly be working with one type. There's positional arguments and keyword arguments or named arguments. That's where you've got something equals. You've been, we've been using positional arguments. Print name or print, we give it two arguments, hello, comma name. Prints out hello, puts a space in between, which we can also customize if we wanted, and then my name. What other functions have you seen in Python? I know I, I've seen a couple of you call functions in your, your terminal there, your REPL. The comma, yeah, well, actually, comma doesn't make the positional argument. Um, comma makes an argument. You've got argument, another argument. If it's just a comma, positional arguments. But if it's a keyword argument, what do we put? What's the symbol you see with a keyword or named argument? Yeah, an equal sign. So if I wanted to change the separator between these, instead of being space, hello, space tray, it's dash. You make it a dash. Or maybe comma space. Maybe we're going to put a, a bunch of things here. And you put comma space between each of them. You can also change the end there. Instead of new line, maybe we can make it two new lines. That backslash in represents a new line character. The reason is... What happens if I make a new line? What's the, the key I hit on my keyboard to make a new line character? Yeah, enter. What does enter do? It runs the code. <laughs> so we need something to represent a new line character. Backslash n. Ooh, that was a weird one that I just did there. Let's type that again. So if I do hello name, I change end. Its default is backslash n. If I make it nothing, what happened? Yeah, it stuck three greater than signs after my name. Sort of. It didn't stick those there. It always puts three greater than signs. There was no new line, and so two lines are just kind of smooshed on top of each other. So now I'm typing Python code right after the end of what kind of looks like a prompt because it just didn't print a new line. We asked it not to. So other functions that I know a couple of you have seen, how can you take a string and turn it into a number? 
Yeah, you turn it into an integer like this. There's two kinds of numbers in Python, though. What's the other kind of number? Yeah, I haven't talked about this. If you have a decimal point in a number, it's a floating point number. It actually works in a different way than an integer does. So two types of numbers. So there's also a built-in float function for turning into a floating point number. What if I have a number and I wanted to turn it into a string? Yeah, maybe there's a string function. Right, some of you have done a Python tutorial before. STR is how we spell string in Python. We like it short for some reason. Uh, and it turns it into a string. So lots of built-in functions. There are, I think, 72, 71, somewhere in there, built-in functions. There's only a dozen or a couple dozen that are probably going to be practically useful for you in day-to-day -day coding. There's stir, there's int, and there's float. There's a number of these things. We've also got print. Uh, we also have other functions that can live in other places. We can define our own functions, but there's also functions that can live in modules. So math is a module that's included with Python. This is called the Python standard library. It has a function in it called squirt. Square root, yeah, that's what it's actually called, but it's spelled squirt. So if I give it a number, it gives us the square root of that number. So there's lots of modules in the Python standard library. There's third-party libraries as well, have their own modules. There's functions in them. And we can call those functions the same way we use any function. What if I don't put parentheses after it and I hit enter? What do you think it might do? Yeah, kind of something similar to what print did. It doesn't do anything useful. It tells us this is a function object you're working with here. Same if you type a variable, you hit enter. It shows you what's in that variable. There's another type of function in Python. If I have a string, and I want to make that string lowercase, we don't have a lower function. There is a way to do this, though. I'm sure a couple of you might have seen this. Anyone remember, for those of you who've taken an intro to Python class before, what that is? Yep. There's a dot, right. Yeah, not lower.name, name dot lower. So we're, we're still calling a function here. We're still calling a function, but it's a function that lives on the name object. Name is a string. And every string has this lower thing on it, this lower function. Anyone know the name that a lot of programming languages really like this, this name, this distinction between this type of function and the other type of function? In Python, we do have this distinction, though we don't care about it as much. There's a, a word for this, yep. Methods, yeah. Something dot something. If there's parentheses after that second something, it's a method. So lower is a method that lives on the string type or the string class. You really don't need to care about that all that much. It's, you can think of it as a function that lives on all strings. So it's just for strings. If I have x equals 4 and I say x dot lower, what's your guess that might happen? So it worked on name. It might work on x. What type is x? Yeah, there's actually a built-in type function in Python. You can pass to it name, see that it's class stir. You can pass to x, see it's an integer. Pass 3.5 to it, see that it's a float. I said strings have a lower method, so you can say name.lower. x isn't currently a string. It's an integer. So if I call lower on it, we do get an error. There's no lower method on integers. So each type of object has its own methods. Eventually, when we talk about lists, you'll see there's an append method on lists. If you have your own custom class, you can have methods that are just for that class. It's a function that's attached to that type of object, only works on objects of that type. Yep. I like this question. There isn't, though. Anyone want to guess how we could get the first letter of a string? Yeah, does it start with something? There is actually a starts with method. So we can say, does it start with P? Oh, that doesn't give us the first letter. We have to guess the first letter at that point. What else could we try to do? I like that name.fl. Doesn't work, though. It's a good guess. Ooh, index. We haven't talked about that. Yeah. What does the index look like? What's the syntax for this? Yeah, a lot of programming languages have this. Not all of them. 
name open square bracket zero close square bracket gives us p. Now, strings aren't the only thing you can index. You can also index lists and anything that is a sequence, which is a fancy word for something you can index basically in Python. Uh, it, it has a length, you can loop over it. We'll talk about loops later and it can be indexed. So I haven't shown you all the things you can do with even strings, which are one of the most basic data types, but you absolutely can do things besides call methods Indexing, concatenating, looping over them are mostly the things we haven't seen. Questions? Yep? Maybe. It depends on the function. So what type does the print function? This is a great question. So the, the question is, a, a general function, not a method, a function that maybe lives at the top level of our code, not something dot something, just the function, does it work with any type of object? We've been passing into print Strings, could I pass in a number to print? What's your guess? Maybe, it seems to work. Could I pass a print into print? No, this feels wrong, right? Seems like this shouldn't work. It works. It says built-in <laughs> function print. That's what happens when we type print and hit enter. So every object in Python can be converted to a string, even a function. Now, its string representation is funny. It's not actually very useful. Every object can be converted to a string. So to answer your question, some functions accept any type of object. Stir is one of them. Print is also one of them, but not all of them. If I ask int to convert three, the string three, to an integer, it says three. If I ask it to convert tray to an integer, what do you think it'll do? Could give us zero. Could give us the number of letters, maybe four. What else could it do? Yes, every letter in programming land is represented by a, n a number, it's numeric, called ASCII, or it was called ASCII, now it's called Unicode because we have you know, things besides just English characters, emoji and uh, all foreign language characters, and all, uh, many characters that are not languages of any sort uh, in Unicode. So there might be some kind of adding up or using of those numbers that are under the hood that represent each of these. We get an error. So strings that aren't anything numeric, we actually get an error. So it's not even just the type. You can pass strings to int, but not all strings. But you can also pass some other things to it. You can pass 3.5 to turn it into an integer. It just lops off the 0.5. What about, could I pass int to int? I could pass print to print. Doesn't seem like you could convert a function to an integer, so no, you can't. So to answer your question, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some functions accept any type of object. Most of them don't. In fact, some of them don't even accept all objects of the same type. You can't always pass a string to int. Some of them just give you an error. Great questions. Other questions? What was that? If Ooh, good question. So if I say 3 plus 2.5, 5.5 is what we hope for. Who thinks 5.5? That's your guess that Python's going to give us. Who thinks an error? Who thinks something else? I want to know what you think. Five or six. It'll round it for us. Maybe it'll give us an integer. Maybe because the integer was first. If we flip them around, maybe it'll give us a float. I'm glad that Python doesn't work that way. We get 5.5. So yes, integer and float, you can always add together. It doesn't matter the order of them. Uh, you can always add them together. So Python, the Python core developers actually had to do something special, some special magic to say, integers actually do not know how to add themselves to floats. Floats know how to add themselves to integers. However, an integer knows how to say, I don't know how to add myself to a float. And then Python goes over to the float and asks it if it knows how to add itself to the integer, and it says yes. All this happens under the hood, and we can be grateful that it works. <laughs> uh, and you can, you can take a look at this yourself if you really wanted to. All objects have these things called dunder methods, double underscore methods. This says not implemented. Integers do not know how to add themselves to floats. But it, there is a right-hand addition, which is the same as left-hand addition. You know, you can do it in either direction, it does the same thing. 
floats no have and soft integers, that's actually what's going on under the hood whenever you use the plus symbol in Python. Now, I'm showing you this not because you need to know it, but because we can be grateful that we don't have to know this. These are the nitty-gritty details of what's going on under the hood. In fact, you might see those sometimes. If you ask for help on an integer and you scroll down, if you go to the Python documentation, you'll see these same things. All these scary-looking double underscore methods, these are all implementing all the various operators in Python. Plus, equals, equals, equals to ask if two things are equal, which we haven't really talked about or seen yet there. All those are implemented and you can actually see them and control them on your own objects in Python. So back to the input function, the input function Python, we can prompt a user for input, which I didn't actually show you. Someone shout out, what's your favorite color? I heard three. Green, okay. I was gonna say three is an odd favorite color. Green. <laughs> Although we could have typed three, Python wouldn't have cared. Color is a variable. We said color equals input, and then it printed out what's your favorite color. I then typed green. What do you think color is right now? What type do you think it is? Yeah, it's a string. Uh, what's your favorite number? I don't have one. Anyone have one? 42. So a classic favorite number there. 42, we hit enter. What type do you think number is? Right, we're torn here. Is it an integer or a string? We typed in an integer, it seems like. It's a string. The reason is input, it doesn't make any assumption about what we're typing. Everything you get from user input starts as a string. Now, what could we do if we wanted to turn it into an integer? Yeah, we pass it to the end function. What is number now? I tricked you. It's a string still. Why is it still a string? Right, we're at the Python REPL. Tricky things are going on here. Int, the int function, we passed a number to it. It gave us back an integer. What did I not do with that thing it gave us? I didn't store it anywhere. We see the result printed out. If I want it saved, what could I do? Yeah, assignment number equals, if I want to use the same variable, or make a new variable if I wanted to. It doesn't really matter. It's up to us how we want to do this. Now it's actually an integer. So you'll sometimes see people do this. We use input. You can actually take the result of input and pass that to a function. I'll show you what I mean by that. Int, and then in parentheses, input. How does Python run this? What do you think it does first? Does it run int first or input? It has to run input first. It actually has to go from the inside out here. Because in order for us to know what to even turn into an integer, input has to run. So first we'll prompt the user for input, then they'll type in a number, and then it turns it into an integer. So you can nest function calls, but it does run them from the inside out, as it would have to if you're taking the result and passing it to another function. Questions or thoughts? Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to repeat the question here. So there's a thing called type coercion that some programming languages have, the notion where you've got an operation, it happens on different types, and then the programming language kind of magically figures out how to convert one type to another for the purpose of the operation actually working. It's automatic type conversion or type coercion. We don't really have that in Python, but this still seemed to work. So it is true we don't have this automatic type conversion in Python. You know, when we said three, a string, plus a number, what happened? Yeah, it loudly failed. It didn't work because we don't have this thing, this automatic type coercion that other languages have. Now, how could we have fixed this if, you know, we have n equals two? That doesn't work. What could I do here, though? 
How could I, because I can add two strings together, how could I turn in into a string? Yeah, pass it to the stir function. So you're right that we do have to go out of our way quite frequently to, uh, to explicitly convert from one type to another, but not always. And the reason is some types know, like floats, for example. Floats, it's very, very common to add an integer to a float. So common that the float type in Python has decided, if you give me an integer, I know how to work with it. And so it's possible for a type of object to take it upon itself to not do automatic type coercion so much as say, I know how to work with objects besides just myself. In fact, we've seen this. A number multiplied by what? What was the thing? It wasn't a string. It was a string multiplied by not a floating point number. It had to be an integer. So in this case, strings know how to work with an integer with multiplication, but not with even strings. So it's sometimes the case they know how to work with multiple types, sometimes only the same type, sometimes only a different type. It's up to the object, though. So you're right, it does seem like it kind of goes against that idea if we don't have automatic type conver conversion, but it doesn't fully go against the idea. Yeah, good question. A little bit of an in-the-weeds question, but it's, it's something you'll see happen often in Python is that idea of we've got to convert between types quite a bit. So I'm going to make a program here called add.py. takes two numbers, and then it adds them together, and it prints out the result. So we need two numbers. What's the first number going to be? Seven. What about the second number? Thirteen. Seven hundred thirteen. That's what happens when you add seven and thirteen together. Why did that happen? Yeah, we got strings. So this is another problem in Python. Plus works on multiple types of things. If they both happen to be strings, Python's happy. It's not going to complain. If they both happen to be numbers, Python's happy. If one's a number and one's a string, it's unhappy. How do we fix this in our case? Yeah, we can convert them. Ooh, I, I like that. We could put it up here, or we could put it down here. Which is the right way to do it? There's a trick question. There isn't a right way to do it. We can do it either way. So let's do it down here. Just because we did do it at the top before, it doesn't really matter where we do it. As long as at the point where that plus operation is happening, we end up with two numbers. So we'll do 7 and 13 again, and it works this time. We get 20. All right, I would like you uh, to try to make another Python program here. I'm not going to give you too long for this one. And uh, does anyone know when the break is? 12.30. No, not that break. I will figure out when the break is during this break here. Uh, because what happened in a past year, we decided to take a break a little bit later, and all the food was gone. I would rather take a break on time, because we want food. <laughs> Yeah, food or drinks there. All right, so I'll give you seven minutes to try this out. Uh, on the website where we're at is input. We're on input, uh, doing input exercises at PYM, or sorry, pycon2023.pym.dev there. So any questions at all, put up a red sticky. If you get through the first exercise, which is printing out the number of things you need for a party based on the number of guests that you have, and different, size, different numbers of things in packages. If you get through that first exercise, put up a green sticky on your machine. We have two minutes left, but I'm gonna change things up here. I want you to stop what you're doing entirely. You're in the middle of something. I'm forcing you to stop whatever you're doing. And we're instead going to take a break to go eat because there is food and drink out there right now. And then afterward, we will come back and you'll continue what we're doing. Uh, how long is the break meant to be? <laughs> I like how everyone who thinks that, everyone who should know how long the break is, we don't know how long the break is. Last year, I thought it was 15 minutes. I couldn't remember if it was 15 or 30. 30 felt too long. Uh, we're gonna do a 15 minute break. Uh, this is not an exercise break, though. I actually do want you to get up away from your machine. Even if you're not getting food and drink, walk around to the room, take a stretch. You need to get, you know, let your brain not think about Python for a minute or so, maybe. So we've got a 15-minute stretch break. 
and then we will get back to it with a few minutes writing some code. If you've got questions in the meantime, feel free to ask. Uh, so we're done with our break break, but we're still in an exercise break. So I'm going to give you a few more minutes here to keep working with input, keep working with the programs you're, you're working on there. I did want to note, there are more exercises in each section than I expect you to possibly get through. So don't feel like you need to get through every exercise. Try out the first one. If you get done with it, try out the next one, uh, as many as you can get through there. But you're always welcome to try, try them uh, again later. If you have questions, stick up a red sticky. If you get done with the first exercise, you end up prompting the user for input, put up a green sticky. We'll get back to it in a few minutes here. All right, we are going to get back to it. We're doing pretty well on time here. A little bit more behind than I expected, but that's all right. Always the case. Uh, so. I want to mention real quick, there will be resources linked on the website. They are not linked now, so as not to distract you. And also because I keep thinking of more resources I want to link, uh, as you are asking great questions on Python. Uh, one I want to link you to right now, though, because it might actually be helpful for some of the exercises. Uh, Tray.io slash built-ins, all one word. Uh, that will redirect you to a blog post I wrote a long time ago. Well, actually not so long ago. I've updated it recently on the built-in functions in Python, which ones to learn first, which ones to learn next. It's about 25 I recommend committing to memory at the point where you actually write in Python code frequently. Or don't commit them to memory, just open up that blog post every time you need to use Python. Uh, and again, there are about 70 built-in functions in Python. You don't need to memorize them. You don't need to know most of them. Most working Python programmers only know two or three dozen of them. It'll get you many years of happy Python programming, just knowing a, a couple dozen Python built-ins. So we've got some input from the user so far. We've printed things out to the screen. What have we not done that would be an, an interesting thing to do with a program? The possibilities we might take our, our coding skills to next. We haven't done number crunching, really, outside of just basic math. We haven't talked about many, I haven't talked about any data structures yet. But what about things getting stuff from outside of our program or putting things outside of our program? Passing arguments to our program, that might be something we could do to control it. What about if we have lots of data? How could we get the data into our program? Yeah. Right, might be stored in a file or a database, yeah. Or we could go to the internet, do an HTTP request and say, I want to go to this website and download this thing. So we're going to talk about files. Now, usually when people talk about files in Python, I want to note that there is a function that's built in called open. We're not going to talk about that. The reason we're not going to talk about that is open involves opening a file, then you have to worry about, do I need to close the file? How do I get things into the file or out of the file? Do I want to read it? Do I want to write it? Instead, I'm going to show you a few lines of code that will seem a little bit magical, but they're a little bit easier to get started with. The first one, we're importing a type of object called path, like a string, like an integer, like a float. It's a, a type of object, a class is what it's called, called path with a capital P from Python's pathlib module. So this, this line we type first, that's our magical incantation to get access to path. Now, I have a file, well, I don't actually have it. I'm going to download it right now, called declarationofindependence.txt. which has the Declaration of Independence in it. It has the, the text of this document in this file. Now, it's a TXT file. It's not a Word document. If I wanted to open up a Word document, I'm going to have a little bit of trouble because Word documents have, they're actually binary files. It's not just plain text. Each type of file needs a separate mechanism for handling that file type. An Excel file, a docx file, a TXT file, a CSV file, a JSON file, Whatever that file type is, you need to handle it in a different way. It's a different format. Text files are by far the easiest. It's kind of the non-format format file, kind of like the non-copyrighted copyright. 
You know, you can take a work and say, my license is it doesn't have a license. This is saying, I don't even have a type to this file. It's just raw text. So we're going to open up this file here by using not the built-in open function, which is what you'll usually see in Python tutorials, but we're going to make instead a path object. So this object here, it's a POSIX path. Anyone know what POSIX means? Anyone who's done some system administration stuff in the past might have seen POSIX before. Uh, there's NT path and POSIX path. NT path you'll see on Windows, Windows NT, which no one talks about anymore, but we still have that verbiage. POSIX path is anything but Windows, basically. Linux path, Mac path, it's Unix, Unix or Linux. So I see a POSIX path on Windows, it'll just say NT path. Same thing, though, it's a path object. So to get stuff out of this, to get the entire file as a string, I can say dot, read text. What is that called again when I say something dot, and then there's parentheses? Yeah, method, which is just a function that lives on that path object. Since it's a function, I have to call it. If I don't have the parentheses, I instead see this bound method thing. I don't want that. I want those parentheses. So I've got our path object, dot read text. Now what I get back, its type is str. It's actually a string that represents everything in this file. If I were to print it, I see the entire file printed out there. So I'm going to type all that again, show you what I did there. Three lines. The first line you only have to do once. So I already did it, doesn't need to be done again. Second line is getting a reference to that path. And then the third line is taking that path, storing it as a string. The entire file is now a string. Now, we don't know how to work with files, or we haven't up to now, but we know how to work with strings. We've used them a little bit. Now that we have a string, we can work with that string just like we've been working with them before. What if I wanted to write some text to a file? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, let's make a file called pycon2023.txt. Call this our pycon path. And I want to say this file here, it should have the text yay pycon in it. How can I do that, do you think? What's your guess? Maybe the right text method? Yeah, so this doesn't work. There's lots of aspirational thinking I could do here. I could say maybe plus works, maybe there's a, another symbol that works. Read text worked before, let's try write text. Pycon path dot, instead of read text, we'll say write text, and we'll give it this string here. Yay, PyCon. Nine. Why do we get nine? <laughs> yeah, there's nine characters in this string. So Python thought it would helpfully tell us nine. Sometimes you get really weird results from functions. This is sometimes useful if you want to know how many things you wrote to a file. This is pretty much there for historical reasons. The notion of writing back in the C world often, how many bytes did I write out to this file is a thing you sometimes want to know. We're just going to ignore that nine. We don't care about it. The thing we care about is in my text editor, I can now see this file. If I list my directory, my folder here, I'll see this pycon2023.txt file. So we just wrote it out. So the two things you can do with pathlib there, read files and write files. There was a question earlier. Or anyone have a question? Maybe I answered it already. So two things. Here's reading from the file. And then if we wanted to write something different to the file. Yep. Great question. Yeah, this is implicitly in our current working directory. So that means when you run any program on your computer, doesn't matter if it's Python or another program, there is a directory or a folder that it thinks it's inside of. You can change that directory it thinks it's inside of. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, but if we had a file that was in a different directory, what could we do, do you think? We've got to tell it where it is. Yeah, we could give it an absolute path. I could say, for example, well, actually, this is in 
home tray, it's in a different directory, or maybe it's in you know, the root directory on my computer or something. So I could give it a different directory there and instead write to that directory in that path. Or I could use dot dot, which means the directory above me, or some a slash b, that would be a, the a directory, the file b below me. So yes, implicitly it's the current directory. Other questions? All right, well, you're going to play with Pathlib a little bit here with reading and writing from files. We're working with strings that are stored in files. Um, where is our read text here? By the way, what do you think will happen when we write text to a file that already exists? What's your guess that might happen? It could overwrite it entirely. It could add to the end. Let's see. So right now, this file has yay PyCon in it. If I write PyCon exclamation exclamation, and I go and I refresh it, that's what we see. So yes, it did and completely overwrite it. If you wanted to add to the end, there isn't an append text. There could be, but they haven't made one. What could you do if you wanted to add to the end of a file? Right, read the file, concatenate something to that string to make a new string that's got the stuff at the end, write it back out to the file. You can always manually add stuff to the end of a file that way. And in fact, that's what you will want to do for the very first exercise in this section. It's called jot. So under files, file exercises, this is, as you'd expect, the most challenging exercise we've done so far. Uh, there is a little bit of a helper you can copy-paste there. It involves taking the current date printing that to a file. We're also prompting the user and asking them. It's basically like a daily journal. You type out a thought that you have, and it sticks to the end of the file, the current date, and the thought that you have there. And I'm going to give you at least 10 minutes on these exercises here to try this first one out. There are a couple other exercises after it, but I'm guessing Jot will probably take you a little while. Uh, if you get through Jot, if you get most of the way through it, stick up a green sticky on your machine. Uh, so take down those green stickies because I know you haven't got through it yet. Uh, if you need some help, you find yourself stuck, put up a red sticky. I'll come by and help you out. And I'm guessing more of you than before will need help on this one. So please don't hesitate to put up a red sticky if you get yourself stuck for 30 seconds or so. So I know the website's a little confusing the way it explains this. Uh, I gave you a starting script that doesn't do what you want yet. It prints out the current date, it does prompt the user, it doesn't write to a file, not only that, it doesn't print anything useful yet, it doesn't print anything out that's useful yet, it doesn't write to the end of a file, certainly. You now need to figure out how can you take that working code that does kind of the wrong thing, but something in the right direction, and make it read from a file, write to a file, stick the current date in there. So again, when you find yourself stuck, which is probably going to happen at some point here, put up a red sticky. And I'm gonna give you a few more minutes as well when you finish this, stick up a green sticky. All right, I know I didn't give you a lot of time, but we're gonna do this together. So very few green stickies up. That means most of us are still working on this, and that is okay. We're going to use our collective knowledge to see what we've learned so far. For those of you who have green stickies up or you're most of the way through, or you finished it and forgot to put the green sticky up, maybe don't answer my questions right now because you already know some of the answers. Those of you who haven't quite got all the way through it, maybe you'll have some um, complementary knowledge. Some of you figured out different things probably here. I know some of you did as I was wandering around. So we're going to make a new file, jot.py. We're going to copy-paste into it these three lines that were on the website. Now, they don't do what we want yet. We know they don't do what we want, but it's a starting point. It does prompt us. Now, it's a funny prompt. It just shows greater than. We're expected to know now that this is a prompt. You can type, uh, it's the first day of PyCon, and I'm teaching. If I hit Enter, just like when we used input before, the result of input, where does that go? Yeah, it actually goes in that variable user message. What are we doing with user message? Nothing right now, so let's print it out. We are printing something, though. It happens to be today's date, so let's do that again. I'll say at PyCon. 
Ah, so now we see at PyCon and today's date, we've got a variable. The variable does seem to work. It got the input from the user, and we got the current date. How do we make a string that has the date colon the message? We're not working with a file yet, but we're supposed to stick that at the end of a file. How can I make a string like that? So I'll say, I'll call this the line, the line that we stick in the file. Well, we're not going to work with the path yet, but how could I get the current date in here, do you think? We're printing the current date. What do I need to do to this line to make it useful for storing in a variable? Yeah, so could I say line equals this thing? What's your guess? Yeah, maybe remove the print. Do you think it'll work with the print? Maybe. So it's, it's prompting us. I'll type A. That's interesting. It printed the first thing we printed. We asked it to print the current date in the same line as this line thing here. Then we got none. We haven't talked about none yet. There's a default return value for every function in Python. Typically, functions return something useful. Print doesn't return anything. It does something. Functions tend to either do a thing or return a thing. Print does a thing. It shows something to the screen. So it doesn't return anything. So we get none, and then it shows A. So let's remove that print, as was suggested there. Let's try that again. Type B. So we see the date and B. B is our user message. Let's remove that. So we do see the date. OK, so we want, we want it to look like this, though. Date, colon, and then our message. So how do we do that? What are we going to type on this line here? Plus, we want to concatenate. What do we want to concatenate with? Colon, space, and then uh, user input? Ooh, yeah, what's missing? Right. So if we run this right now, we get a syntax error. We need quotes there to make this into a string. Does that work? Ooh, it, it didn't do anything because I didn't print anything. Let's try it again. Ah, user message, right, wait. And also, it said user input. Why well, didn't actually show what I typed? If I type tray or I type type, it says user message instead. Right, user message is inside the quote. OK, so we got colon space in our quote. Concatenate again. So you can concatenate just like if you say 2 plus 3 plus 4. You can add three numbers together. You can concatenate three strings together. There is a way to do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm not expecting you to memorize it, but it is called an F string. It looks like this. An F string is basically flipping string concatenation on its head. So string concatenation, I described, what did I describe it as, string concatenation? Right, this. It's this. It's smooshing things together. This is called string interpolation. It's not smooshing together. It's more of sticking inside of. We're saying we've got a, build, a big string we're building up. We want to inject into it a couple things. Those things in the curly braces are the little bits of code that give us the thing to stick in there. You notice we don't have to convert these things to a string. That's optional. It'll convert them to a string for us. So we'll do it just way. That's for the fun of it, just because we've seen this. All right, we've got our line in the right format. How do we get it in our file? Yeah, well, you need to write to the file. So can I say jot? jot.txt dot write text line. We need pathlib from pathlib import path. We'll put that line. So this is called an import. You tend to see these at the very top of a file. All the things you're importing come first, kind of like you're declaring, here are all the things I need. OK, now let's use those things. So we've got this path thing we can use, just as we have this date thing that we're using. So if I say path, jot.txt, will this work here? Path equals this thing. 
Maybe I'll call this a jot path. What method did we have on these path objects for writing to them? Yeah, write text. So let's try to give it our line. So instead of printing it out, we'll try to write it to the file. Ooh, do we not need quotes? Well, well, what's your guess? When I hit enter, what do you think might happen? Sounds like your guess is you think it'll be an error. It wasn't an error. Oh, it was an error. <laughs> so a problem in PyCon, or in Python, I guess in PyCon as well, uh, sometimes Python's running your code and it's fine, and then suddenly it's not fine and the error blows up later. You can't always tell if your program starts that it is, in fact, correct. Now, it didn't loudly complain here until we got to jot.txt. This is actually valid Python syntax. What is it interpreting this as? Yeah, variable. It thinks, oh, jot's a variable. It must have an attribute called txt. An attribute is something dot something. If there's parentheses, it's a method. It's a function attached to something. We haven't talked about attributes, but they do exist in Python, something dot something. So we need to put quotes around here for Python to see that is a string. It's not supposed to be a variable lookup. It did something. What should it have done? How do we know whether it worked? Right. Do we have a file called jot.txt? We do. Let's open it up, see what's in it. It says we're at PyCon. When we run it again, what is it supposed to do? What is it meant to do again? Yeah, it's supposed to add to the end. So if I say we're at PyCon, uh, we're going to eat lunch. It didn't add to the end. It completely overwrote the file. How could I get it to add to the end? What could we try to do here, maybe? Yep. Right, so read the file. We're not giving anything to it. It'll we'll get back, though, the contents of the file. Say contents, and you're saying concatenate here the contents with our line, and then write it out, maybe like that. Let's see if it works. At PyCon still. And then we'll look at our jot.txt file. Well, that was weird. What happened there? It didn't put it on a new line. What else happened? It's the same message twice, at PyCon still, at PyCon still. OK, so let's look at our code here. <laughs> We've got our path. We're writing to the file. We read from it, but we just wrote to it. So we overwrote our file. So that might be where our problem is here. Instead of making guesses, though, I'm going to show you a function called breakpoint. Usually folks don't show new programmers breakpoint. I think new programmers should probably know about breakpoint, even though, a warning here, this is going to be scary because we're going to enter the Python debugger. So you've got your code editor, the Python REPL, your system command prompt, and now there's a fourth thing we have to worry about, the Python debugger. The Python debugger, it acts kind of like the Python REPL, though it's not quite the same. Uh, we're going to type at PyCon. What seems to happen here? What do we see that's different than before? We see a path here, home tray, PyCon 2023, jot.py. What else? There's a number nine. Jot path equals, this looks like Python code. Yeah, this is the next line in the file after breakpoint. We're actually stepping through our Python program here. So in the Python debugger, you can do things kind of like at the REPL. For example, I can say jot path. Just like at the REPL, it shows me, it would show me what's in that variable, except I don't have a jot path variable yet because that's defined on the next line of code. It's defined right here. It hasn't been defined yet. However, I do have a line variable. That's the line. 
To go to the next line of code, we can type n. We just ran this line of code, which means we should have a jot path variable, and we do. So we're actually interactively running our program. Kind of like how at the Python repo, we're interactively working with Python. We're typing lines of code and seeing results. We've basically injected ourselves into this program. We've put the program on pause and said, we want to run the next line of code. All right, we're going to poke around. Don't, don't run the next line of code yet until we ask you to. Uh, so right now, our path, we've got our path defined. If we say read text, this is what's in that file. This is what was there before. If I run the next line of code, the line that ran was this write text line. We're now just about to run the read text line. So we've now written to the file, if we read text, this is what's now in the file. We just overwrote the whole file. So I want to mention the Python debugger breakpoint, uh, even though it is scary, because at some point, you may find that using print to debug your code isn't quite enough. It's kind of confusing sometimes to figure out what you even need to print. Sometimes you just wish you could drop into a Python REPL. And in fact, this scary land here, we can make it slightly less scary by typing interact. Where are we now, do you think? What does this usually symbolize? Yeah, we're in the Python REPL. Those three greater than signs mean we're actually in a real Python REPL. In fact, there's a function in Python called dir. It tells you all your currently defined variables, all these ones that have underscores we just ignore. There's line, there's jot path, there's user message, there's date. So we can poke around and see those. If I type exit, it does actually, in fact, exit my whole program, which is unfortunate. I thought it was going to go back to the Python debugger, but we'll just ignore that fact. Um, anyways, breakpoint is the way to start the Python debugger. The way to fix this program, has anyone seen it yet, the way we can fix this? We do need to read the file. We do need to write from it. We're writing twice, though. We're overwriting the file first. We need to read from it and then stick on the end and then write. Someone noted we're sticking a line of code on the same line as another line. How do we fix that? Yeah, we need a new line. So we need a little bit extra concatenation. What's the symbol we use for a, a new line? Backslash n. So the current contents of the file, let's stick a line at the end, and then we'll put another line there. Oops. Let's run this code again. I'm going to remove breakpoint. Ooh, we have a problem. Leading zero in decimal, not permitted. Oh, it's because I tried to run jot.txt, which is not a Python program. You can give files that are not py files to Python, and it'll just try to run them as programs. Maybe it worked. Let's go look at jot.txt. At PyCon, at PyCon. All right, let's try it again. Uh, at lunch, at PyCon. It worked. Now, there is a possible problem in this program. If the file doesn't exist yet, what do you think might happen? Yeah, when we try to read from it, we could get an empty string back. It might also give us an error. Let's try it out. So we don't have an error yet. We do get an error. So I didn't show you how to fix this, but also the way to fix this is to make the file exist, and then your program magically works. Sometimes a workaround is a decent solution. Uh, one thing you could do, though, is you could look up on path objects in Python. How do you ask whether a path exists? There is actually a way to do that. So if jotpath.exists, there's also an is file, is file versus is directory. Either one's a, a perfectly good way to do this. If it doesn't exist, we'll set the contents to an empty string. I just used something we've never seen before. What is that? If else, yeah. Let's talk about if else. Before we do, though, any questions? Yep. 
Uh huh. Good question. So the question is, os.path is a thing that you'll see on Stack Overflow results. You'll see it if you're looking at Python code that works with file paths. Pathlib is this newer thing. That's what you've heard. Is os.path going away? Is it being replaced by Pathlib? What's going on there? Uh, the answer is os.path will probably never go away because lots of code uses it. It's just a lot of old code floating around. And there's no reason to make it suddenly disappear because it would just break things for no particularly good reason. Uh, Pathlib is very well supported by everything at this point, though. It's newer in the sense that it is much newer than OS.path. It's not actually very new at this point, though. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's not 20 years old. <laughs> like, well, OS.path is even older than that, in fact. Uh, also, Pathlib is slower. If you are traversing your file tree and you're looking at thousands of files on your system, lots of different paths, Pathlib takes a little bit more time to make the path object because it's got some fancy methods attached. OS.path is all strings. Strings are fast, even though strings can be messy. So I would recommend Pathlib over that OS.path thing when you see it. They both work, though. A little bit of an in-the-weeds question, but I, I like those. You see stuff online, you want to know what the answer is. So I want to note here something I don't think I mentioned at the beginning. We're not going to learn all of Python today. You probably guessed this, but in three hours, you can't possibly learn all of Python. It doesn't matter how advanced you are already in programming or in Python. Uh, we're only getting a taste for Python, which means we will see if and else in a moment. We'll see loops. We'll see lists. That's about where we'll end. Beyond that, there's functions. There's the standard library. There's modules. There's list comprehensions. There's tuple unpacking. There's indexing. There's slicing. There are so many other features that exist in Python. Uh, they're all built pretty much on these features we're talking about today, though, for the most part. So we're going to talk now about if-else, and we're going to do it by using if-else. So I just used if-else to ask, does a file exist? Before I talk about if-else, I want to ask you, some of you have done some programming before, what do you think will happen when I hit enter? False. It's a funny guess if you've never done programming before. Zero equals equals one, false. But it is false with a capital F. We have in Python a variable false and a variable true. It's capital F false, capital T true. We don't have the lowercase ones. This is asking, is zero equal to one? So the those of you who knew this syntax, the answer is obvious. Zero is not equal to one. Equals equals is the way we say this. Why not equals? Yeah, this assigns something. Now, we can't assign to zero, so in fact, in this case, it, it wouldn't be ambiguous. But if I said name equals tray, and I wanted to ask, well, is name equal to tray? I can't do it this way. That's an assignment. You've got to use equals equals. So you can use equals equals to ask, is a string equal to another string? Is a number equal to a number? Could I ask, is a string equal to a number? What's your guess? So you think the answer will be true or false? False. Yeah, it's not an error. In fact, equals equals shouldn't ever give you an error. Objects in general, just as all of them are supposed to have a good string representation of some sort, all of them should give you an answer with equality. Question? Ah, good question. So the reason there's quotes around my name, not around the number, there are two types of things. So I'm going to do it a different way. x equals 0, y equals 0. Both of those worked. What's the type of y? It's a number, specifically an integer. This is the kind of the weird one. What's the type of x? Stir, string. So this in Python, this is a problem you will run into a lot. Even after you've been doing Python for a while, it's hard to internalize the fact that there's really three things. There's variables, which are when we have something like x, Right, x is a variable. It doesn't have quotes around it, but it has some characters in it. It represents a pointer to something. And then there's a string that's got quotes around it. That's a, you can think of it as literal characters. It's like the things you'd write on a piece of paper. When we don't have quotes around it, that's something special. It's either a number, or it's a variable, or it is a special syntax. This here, 
this is a string, this is not a string. This is called a list. The square brackets mean something. So whenever something's in quotes, you're making a string object, just literal characters. If it's not in quotes, something else special is going on. In our case, we're working with a number. Yeah, great question, which means x is zero, y is zero. Is x equal to y, do you think? False, they're both zero, but one is zero the string, one zero the number. Now, int of x, is that equal to y? It is, and x equals equals stir of y, that's also true. Converting them to the same type, then they're actually equal. So we don't just have equality in Python, we also have inequality. Anyone want to guess what inequality looks like? Yeah, so there's a few different ways that different languages do this. Python doesn't do it this way. This does something different. This is division, actually. Division and assignment at the same time. That's confusing. Uh, some languages also do this. In fact, Python 2 used to support this. It's kind of a SQL way of doing things. This is the way we do it in Python. Exclamation mark equals. It doesn't equal. Uh, we also have, as you hope, greater than is one greater than zero. We have greater than or equal to, you know, less than or equal to. What about this? What's your guess? Could we ask, is a string less than a string? Lots of yeses. What do you think it's going to do? Alphabetical, maybe? So you think it'll be true here? The size of the string, maybe? I don't know. It's true. So A comes before B in the alphabet. Okay, let's try it this way. We'll say um, A less than capital B. True or false or error? False. It is false. What about capital A less than lowercase b? Now we're confused. <laughs> it's true. So it's true for a strange reason. All the capital letters come before all the lowercase letters. So if you're comparing two strings, you want to make sure that you're comparing them with the same case. Now, I'm talking about strings. We're using just characters here. What about a string with multiple characters? Is this possible, do you think? What do you think it does? It kind of seems like it'd be like when you went through these, these old books we used to have. You'd flip through them. They had words in them. They were called dictionaries. Now we go to dictionary.com, right? We don't care about alphabetical ordering on dictionary.com. You care about them in a dictionary, in alphabetical order. Apple doesn't come before animal, L-M-N-O-P. Animal comes before apple. But case does matter. So even though the A is the same, it goes to the next letter and sees which one is less than the other one. What about special characters? Yeah, what about the number zero? Is that less than the letter A? We should probably ask ourselves, why are we asking this question? We're going to get a weird answer, right? It is going to be either true or false. It turns out it's true. That one's true as well. I believe zero is 48 on the ASCII table. It really comes, where does it come in the ASCII table? If it's an emoji character, it's usually at the end. If it's a digit, it's at the beginning. If it's a linguistic character that's a non-English linguistic character, it's somewhere in the middle. So you want to be careful about what it is you're comparing when you're ordering your strings. All right, we're about to get to if statements. One more operator I'd like to show you. We talked about equals equals, not equals, comparing things with less than and greater than. Uh, if I want to ask whether my name has a Y in it, whether it contains a Y, What's your guess that I could do? Now, I want you to just guess, complete guess of what I could type in here. You, for those who don't know the answer, there could be a method, name dot, what would the method maybe be called? Contains, that's a good guess. Does it contain the string Y? There is no contains method, that's a good guess though. Name.in, ooh, invalid syntax, that should signify something. There is a find method, which is interesting. It gives an index. There's actually an operator in Python for doing this. What's the operator? I know some of you know this. Yeah, in, 
Most programming languages don't have this. Why in the name? Is why in the name? It is in the name. Uh, is Z in the name? That's false. And this is case sensitive. So is T in the name? That's false because it's a lowercase t. Capital T is in there. We have in. What's the opposite of in? Out. Yeah. T out name. Well, that didn't work. Yeah, not in. Wait, is there an operator with a space inside it? Is that valid? It is. The Python core developers decided not space in is a valid operator. They went out of their way to make that work. All right, so let's finally use if statements. So we have the answer to a question. We get true or false. These are yes, no questions. In Python, it's very, very common to ask a question that has a yes or a no, and based on the result of that, you do something or you don't do something. So we can say the year is 1999. If the year is equal to 1999, there's our syntax for an if statement in Python, colon, and then I hit enter, something weird happens. What happened that's kind of unusual? Yeah, we see three dots. We don't see three greater than signs. Python knows that there is more to come. That colon means there's a block of code. Uh, so who knows that Python indentation is somehow important in some way? This is something that people often complain about. Even if you've never used Python, you might hear people complain about the fact that indentation matters in Python. This is where we finally see that indentation matters. At the Python REPL here, we could hit tab, we could hit space a few times, whatever we'd like, typically four spaces, although the tab key usually in your text editor will insert four spaces. We now can write some code. It could be one line or multiple lines. Let's write it's 1999. Oop, that's a bigger year. So we should party uh, quite a bit. And then if we hit enter again, well, you still see three dots. What do we do? I mean, we could type more code, but what if we actually wanted to end? What's your guess? Yeah, for the, the few of you who've used the Python REPL with multiple lines of code already, you have to hit enter again. So the reason for this, it's something specific to the Python REPL. It doesn't know when we're done. What do some other programming languages use to say, here's a block of code and here's the start and the end? Yeah, a curly brace. So C, Java, JavaScript, some of these languages say if curly brace, then you're going, and then finally there's a closed curly brace. We don't have those in Python. It's all about indentation. The problem is with indentation, we don't know if our indentation's done until we've outdented our line of code. There is no outdent at the Python REPL, so you've got to hit enter twice. So this is specific to the Python REPL. You've got to hit enter twice to end your block of code when you're writing an if statement. So we don't just have if in Python. This is if something's true, we run some code. If it's not true, if it's 2,000, and we run this same bit of code again, it's not going to print anything because it's not true. What do we do if we want it to do a different thing if it's not true? Else, yeah. So we can say if the year is 1999, we do those same things as before. Right after that, else, and then a colon. There's no condition with an else. There is actually a way to add a condition, though, optionally. You don't want to guess what the way to add an optional to chain conditions is? L if. Some languages call this else if or else if. None of them call it elf for some strange reason. Some languages call it elf. We call it elif, four characters just like else. Uh, elif, the year is less than 1999. Uh, I don't know what we type here. It's still the 90s. Not quite time to party, right? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, the party's over. So it says the party's over because year right now is 2000. So this is pretty much the, not the biggest elf, uh, elf the biggest if statement you'll see, uh, but this is, the biggest style. This is all the things you can possibly throw in there. There's if, there's l if, there's else. If has to, or else has to have if before it. How many else's do you think you can have on if? Just one. How many l ifs do you think you can have? 
Yeah, zero worked. You don't have to have an elif, just like you don't have to have an else. You can have lots of them, though. Elif, elif, elif. It has to come before the else, though, and in between the if. So you always start with the if, end with the else if there is one, and you sandwich elif in the middle if there are any elifs there. It does not, only elif. There is no else if in Python. Now, you could say else, indent, do another if, and indent further. But you're going to have to indent even more if you did that. So technically, yeah, you could get something like else if. You can't do it on one line, though. Like you could in, say, C or Java or some other languages. Yep, I've been hitting four spaces here, but yeah, you typically hit tab. Basically, every text editor knows if you have a file open and it ends with .py, it should use four spaces. Four spaces is typically what we use in Python to indent. You can technically use anything. If you really want to upset people, use three spaces. <laughs> not quite right, but not wrong enough to notice easily. Uh, but four spaces is what typically happens when you hit the tab key. Five spaces is also equally bad. Uh, so we're now going to write some if statements. I, I'd like you to, even if you don't write it at the REPL, you can write it in a text editor and copy-paste it in. I do want you to try copy-pasting it into the REPL because it's going to be frustrating. <laughs> I don't want you to be frustrated, but I do want you to understand that the REPL works a little differently than your text editor does. It's a little pickier about whether there's, uh, you've hit enter twice, for example. Your indentation is going to matter in both your text editor and the REPL. Uh, but when you find yourself making a mistake, it's frustrating in the REPL because you have to start over. You have to type all the code again. So type it in your text editor, maybe copy-paste it into the REPL so you don't get too frustrated there, but try running it from the Python REPL. So try out some if statements. We're on the website under conditionals, conditional exercises. Um, we have about a half an hour left here. I think... 12.15, I think, is the time I should be stopping here because lunch is at 12.30, and we took a 15-minute break. Is my reasoning right there? Anyone want to correct me? The calendar says to 12.30. Okay. The video will maybe be a little bit longer. I'm fine going until 12.30. Everyone fine with 12.30? Excellent. We'll go to 12.30 then. I will... We might want to stop like a couple minutes before just so we get a head start on lunch. <laughs> but yeah, 12.30 basically is when we'll stop. Oh, and if you find yourself stuck while you're writing an if statement, probably it's a syntax error, but I want you to put up a red sticky and uh, we'll try to help you out. So put up a red sticky when you find yourself stuck. If you end up writing an if elif statement or if statement rather successfully, put up a green sticky. So if you're trying to take and ask two questions at the same time in Python, for example, is the year... Uh, less than 1999, or is the year greater than 1999? In other programming languages, those you've done them before, how do you do or? Right, yeah, I like this. This way, whatever that symbol is. Nobody knows the name of that thing. Uh, this thing, it's called a pipe symbol. Year, or, year. This doesn't work in Python. Anyone found out what this is, what we have to do instead? Yeah, it's deceptively like English, or. We have or and we have and. So if you find yourself wanting to ask two questions at once, we've got or and we've got and. All right, I know that wasn't long, uh, but we are going to move on because we don't have too much time left. Uh, we're going to move on to talk about, finally, our first data structure in Python. Anyone want to guess what our first data structure is going to do? For those of you who've done some programming, well, what is a data structure? Anyone want to try to explain that? I'll give you a hint. It's a structure, and there's data involved. Yes, it stores data. <laughs> a data structure stores data. It's kind of boring. Um, data structure is really just a way of saying we've got some stuff. It's not a string. It's not a number. It's something more than that, something more sophisticated. And there's a common way we tend to want to work with it. Uh, the first data structure you typically see in Python, the very most common one, 
is this. What do other programming languages sometimes call this thing where you've got multiple things stored together in a particular order? Yeah, an array or a list. In Python, we call it a list. Some languages call it an array, an array of things, a list of things. I kind of like list because it sounds like a, a shopping list, you know, a grocery list, a, a list of things. I might list things out, right? It's also kind of a verb. So this list, and we can check its type using the built-in type function and confirm it is, in fact, a new type, class list. If we want to get the first thing in this list, what could we try to do? I'll give you a hint, it's similar to when we got the first character in a string. Yeah, square bracket. And then what do we put in there? Yeah, why not one? We're programmers, so we start counting at zero for some strange reason. <laughs> there, there are good reasons for this, but we start counting at zero. That's the thing to internalize to remember there. What if I put in 10? What's your guess? Could be an error, could be nothing. Yeah, what, what's the thing that represents nothing in Python? None. Turns out it is an error. Sometimes we get none back, though getting an index of 10 on a list that doesn't have 10 things, that is an error. How could we find out how many things are in this list, do you think? Yeah, somehow get its length. A lot of languages have this notion of you take a list, you access a length attribute. A dot B is an attribute lookup. We don't have a length attribute in Python. Right, we have len, but it's not a method. It's actually a built-in function. So to get the len of something or the length of something, you pass icon feelings to the length function. Kind of weird that it's a built-in function. It doesn't live on the object. Why is that, do you think? What else might have a length? Right, it, it might work with different, anything that you could count the number of. If it has a length, that's kind of a property. It could be a generic property. We can index strings and lists. It's not a method we use. We use square brackets as a special syntax. Kind of similar, we use a special built-in function. Just as you can convert multiple things to an integer or a string, you can get the length of multiple things. So if I say length of a string, we get the length of the string. Now, the length of everything in Python is not four. Let's do something that's not four. <laughs> length of an empty string is zero. Length of a list with, by the way, you can have mixed things in a list. We have strings, we've got numbers. You can even mix up your strings and numbers. Python really doesn't care about types all that much. We practice something called, if I can find this here, this, you probably can't see it on the recording. What is this little thing I'm holding up? A rubber ducky, uh, which is also useful for debugging your code, by the way. You can look up rubber duck debugging on Wikipedia. It is a real thing. If you find yourself stuck and you're not in a room of myself and Melanie and other people to ask questions to, talk to your rubber duck. It's not going to respond. I mean, hopefully it won't respond. That's, you've got other problems if it responds. Um, but, or you've got maybe a talking. Maybe it's good if it responds. It depends on the type of duck. Talk to your rubber duck, and just verbalizing the question will sometimes help you figure out a possible landscape of answers. Anyways, in Python, we both have rubber duck debugging, but we also have duck typing, which is the idea that if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if I'm asking, do these objects work with plus? I don't check them and say, well, are they plusable objects? I just try out the plus operator, and if it works, it works. That happens a lot. The built-in len function is another example of that. I could pass x to it. I don't know what x is. If it works with the built-in len function, we'll get a length. If it doesn't, it won't. Now, I don't know what was x. Oh, it was 0, apparently, in a string. Let's make y 4. What do you think the length of the number 4 might be? Could be zero, could be one, could be four. Oh, that, that was the length of x. It is an error. You can't get the length of an integer. So practicing duct typing, we try it out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But multiple things can work with the built-in len function. Lists are one of them, strings are another. 
Okay, so we've made a list. We made a list of PyCon feelings here. How could we change a list? Typically, with a list of things, the most common thing to do with lists in Python is to stick something on the end or to remove something from the end. Uh, after that, it's common to change a particular value. So we know that if we wanted to get uh, amazing from this list, how could we do that? We'd have to know its position. What is its position in the list? Remember, we start counting at 0. Yeah, 0, 1, 2, so position 2. I can assign to PyCon feelings position 2 to change this feeling. What feeling should we put in here? Super amazing. We really like PyCon. And it's changed it to super amazing. If I want to add to the end, what's your guess? There's a method we can use. What verb do you think we might use? Could be append. You already knew the answer. What's another verb we could use? One that's not quite right. Yeah, add is the one I, I often would guess first. We do have an add in Python. It doesn't exist on list. It does exist on sets. Instead, we have append. What's another feeling? Anything. Lacking bees is a valid feeling. You can put anything here. What's a, what's a feeling you have? Hungry. Yeah, I also have that feeling. So append. What's the opposite of append, do you think? Remove. Confusingly, we do have a remove method on lists. It doesn't remove the last thing. It's not the opposite of append. You have to give it a thing to remove, and if that thing is in that list, it removes it. To remove from the end, we pop. So this is a computer science-y term. If you have a stack, like a stack of plates, you can pop something from the top of the stack. Anyone know what the opposite of pop is in computer science land? You push something onto the stack. We don't have push in Python. Perl has a push and a pop. Python has an append and a pop. I'm not sure how that mishap happened, but that's the way things are. I actually like append better than push, but it's a little bit unfortunate that we have pop, even though the opposite of pop is push. So to add to the end of a list, you can append, and to remove from the end, you can pop. Let's make sure it's actually in the list first. Yep, it did add to the end. Now notice pop gives us back the thing that it's popping, and it changes the list. That's a little bit unusual. Most functions in Python either do a thing or they return a thing. Pop does both. It gives us the thing back, and it changed the list. Some functions do both do a thing and return a thing. It's, it is unusual, though, in Python. Questions on lists, thoughts on lists. We're going to get some practice with lists in a moment here. Question for you. Uh, how could I find out whether... Um, Scared is one of the things in this list. Yeah, we had an in operator that works on strings. It works on lists, too. This is a very common theme you'll see in Python. If you know how to do something with one type of object, similar objects often work with that same operation, kind of in the same vein of duck typing, that lots of things have the notion of containment. Does in work with them? They have a length. Does len work with them? They can be indexed with those square brackets. Are they indexable? All right, we have some exercises here. We actually have two sets of exercises. Uh, you can pick which one you'd like to do. So the first one is lists, list exercises. Uh, that one does not involve changing lists at all, only asking questions of lists. The other one, if you've done a little bit of programming before, you might find a little bit more interesting. It's in more lists, more list exercises at the bottom of the page there. Uh, and the first one there is a random vacation planner. So it's picking random locations, random amounts of time, and random destinations to go on a vacation. Well, not a, the greatest Python program, but kind of a funny one. Uh, and then after that, there's a state capital guesser, which is kind of fun because you start with the US states and capitals, and then you have to make a program that prompts the user and tells them whether they, they guessed correctly there. Uh, that first one, 
There's a guest list and a couple other exercises and list exercises there. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time on these here. Uh, after this, we'll talk about iteration in Python, and then I'd like to answer your questions. If you have a question, you've had questions, try to write them down, uh, because we will have a little bit of time at the end to answer questions before lunch. So any questions right now as you're going through these, put up a red sticky. If you get through an exercise, doesn't matter which exercise it is, if you get through an exercise right now, stick up a green sticky, and I'll be floating around the room here. I have a question for you as you're working on this. Who has found a way to get a random thing from a list in Python? What was it? There's something in the random module. There's actually a couple things you might be able to use. Yeah, there's one. That's what I would recommend using. If you have, say, a random list of colors here, you can say random.choice and give it your list and it will give you a random thing from that list. So I would recommend if you're doing that random vacation planner, you might want to check out random.choice. Reminder, if you find yourself stuck, put up a red sticky, even if you just want a, a rubber duck to chat with. All right, we are going to solve one of these together real quick. I started with this statesandcapitals.py file. Uh, missing white space. Oh, I've got some funny, there we go, hit that. Uh, this is a very big list of lists. You can see this list has lots of lists in it. Each has two things in it, a state and a capital. We're meant to ask the user, what is the capital of a state? which means we need to get a random state and capital. How could we do that? We've got the random module. What could we use with this states and capitals list? Yeah, if we need to get a random, what's the, the way that I just showed to get a random item? Yeah, random.choice. So random.choice, let's just print that out just to see if it even works. This is a good way to, to write your code is not do everything at once. Don't try to be super ambitious. Just try to see if the very basic thing works. Can we get a random state and capital? We got Hawaii, Honolulu. We got a different one. That's good enough for me. It looks random. Okay, so this is our state and capital. We now want to ask the user, uh, what is the capital of a state, of a particular state? How do we get access to the state? Yeah, it's in that state and capital list, which is a two-item list. How do you get the first thing in a two-item list? Zero. zero, so plus state and capital, index zero. Okay, so we, we need a question mark at the end, though. So question mark and a space to make this look a little bit nicer. And it's supposed to prompt them. I'm using print. How do we prompt a user? Input. Right, input. So input will both print and get a response, so we'll say guess equals this thing. Our code's a little bit long. I'm actually going to break this up over multiple lines. This is something you're allowed to do in Python. Normally, when you hit enter in the middle of a line of code, Python complains. It doesn't care here. Anyone want to guess why? Yeah, that open parenthesis lets Python know there is more to come. So it's OK with us writing that over multiple lines of code. Anyone guess what the capital of Pennsylvania is? I have no idea whether it was right. It didn't tell us. <laughs> so now we need to do something with that guess. Uh, what, what question do we ask? We've got an if. So if index one, which should be the correct capital, if it is equal to our guess, then we'll print out, yay, great job. Uh, otherwise, We'll print out, maybe we should say what the actual capital is. Incorrect. Uh, the capital is actually, oh, now we need to say state and capital one. Virginia. Virginia. 
Sacramento. Oh, interesting, it wasn't Sacramento. (laughs) It was apparently Charleston. It seems like it works. Let's do one that's actually valid. New Mexico. Yay, great job. We had a working program. Questions or thoughts in our last 10 minutes here? There's one more thing I want to show you before we wrap up. Yep. Ah, right. Yeah, this... Yep. This is a great question. So the question is, if you said, I'm good, and you've got a list of things, there's good in there, but I'm good isn't in good, and you'd have to somehow maybe loop over your list and say, well, is good in I'm good, or is part of what I have in that thing? So we're about to talk about loops. You could loop over uh, your list and say, is instead of, is my item here within the list, ask the opposite. Is each of the items in the list, or any of these in what I'm working with here, is good in it? I'm good. The other way is a scary thing that is often used in text processing in many programming languages. Anyone know what I'm about to say? Parsing, even scarier than that. It's called regular expressions. It's a programming language inside of a programming language where everything is on one line of code, there's no white space in comments, and every symbol is actually a line of code. It sounds awful. And it is a little bit awful, although it's also very powerful. Regular expressions are are one way to maybe do some pattern matching. We're not going to do regular expressions, though. I do have a tutorial online, regex.training, that website. will take you to a a PyCon tutorial on that, though. Uh, So what I'd like to do now is take a list and do something for every single item in the list. What can I use for this in Python? A for loop, yeah, a lot of programming languages have a notion of a for loop. Many of them look like this. For i equals zero, i is less than the len of fruits, and then i plus equals one. We don't have this in Python. We're thinking in terms of indexes here. Python doesn't have that at all. Instead, we say for fruit in fruits. No index. We just get each item. If you look up in Wikipedia, for each, all one word, a for each loop, that's what we have. We call it for in, or typically just for, because that's our only for loop in Python, is a for in loop. It gets each item in the list. What if you're trying to do something that's specific over a time zone? Like earlier we had that breathing program and I wanted to repeat it four times. Right, how could we do something four times? Like meditative breathing, for example, great question. Ideas. Ooh, I like that. That's a thing that's a little bit more advanced, but we can take a look at that. What other ideas? We w- yep, we would need a while loop for that. If you want to manually add things, you have a condition and you've got something you're incrementing maybe. If, if you need a loop with a condition, that's called a while loop. So while, say, x is greater than 10, something like that, and you're decrementing x, we have that. We don't tend to use them often. The reason is we tend to try to model everything in Python from the perspective of an iterable. That is something you were able to iterate over. So a list is an iterable. If you can write a for loop to loop over it, it's an iterable. Can I loop over a string, do you think? Yeah. In fact, before I loop over a string, how does Python know the singular of fruits? And it doesn't. That's a variable name. I can call that whatever I want. I'm essentially assigning, I'm defining a variable there. X is under our control. So I could say, let's take a string like my name. For X in name, what do you think this will print? It's kind of like when we index, right? Every character, every character in the string. Anything you can loop over is an iterable. So there is an iterable in Python called a range that you can get from calling the range function. Range of 10 gives you this thing that if you loop over it, will count upward from 0 to just before 10. 
you see this a lot in Python, either a built-in function or some kind of utility for making an interval when you didn't have an interval because you need to loop. We l really love our for loops in Python. <laughs> Not that we don't use while loops, but we like modeling things from the perspective of a for loop. Now, if you didn't know about range, how could you make a string that has 10 zeros in it? Yeah, zero times 10. We could loop over a string to get the same thing there, or we learned about how strings and lists are similar in many ways. That works on lists too. You can actually also use plus on lists. You can concatenate strings, you can concatenate lists. You can also multiply lists by themselves, self-concatenation. Now, range would probably be the right way to do this, though, the easy way to do it. Other questions on loops? Yep. Right, yeah, you can't do that. So it's kind of funny because in, we've seen in, it was for containment checking, right, is x in y. This is a different in. So for x in name, this doesn't work because it's actually not the in operator. It's a different in. It's actually part of the for loop syntax. Kind of confusing. You see this a lot in Python, in fact. Else isn't just for if else. There's try else, there's even a for else. I think there's a while else. You hopefully won't see those because they're weird. Try else you might see. If else, you'll almost certainly see. So sometimes the same keyword is used in different ways in Python, which is kind of confusing, but it's just the way things are. For, it would be 4x in range 4. Yep. Yeah, you don't have to print x. You do something else. You'd probably ignore x. In fact, if you want to ignore a variable and you want to make it clear you don't care what it is, sometimes people use underscore. Underscore is actually a valid variable name. It's kind of it's a convention for a throwaway variable, saying, I don't care what the value is. So we wouldn't actually usually use underscore there. We'd say print hello. We'd print hello four times. Of course, you can call it whatever you want for x in, for y in, for count in. Uh, so we don't have too much time for you to do exercises individually. So what I'd like to do instead is in our last few minutes together, that breathe.py that some of you worked on earlier, where we used time.sleep to sleep for a few seconds. And we would say breathe in and then breathe out. You were supposed to do this over and over for two minutes. How can we do this over and over? Right, you could have copy-pasted before, but now that we know about range, let's say for x in range, now how many times do we want to do it? So we were supposed to do this for two minutes, and we wanted it to be, I think it was, was it a six times a minute? Once every six seconds. So I guess seconds equals six. Uh, once every six seconds there. So how many times we would do it would be, what's our math involved? Two times 60 is the number of seconds total. Divided by six, is that right? Let's see if it works. Oop, float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. Ah, what's going on here? On this line of code, by the way, this is called a traceback. Who's seen a traceback before? Everyone should be raising their hands. You've all seen this even though you didn't know it. You, whenever you see an error in Python, you see this printed out. The last one, the last line there is the line you read first. That tells you the type of error and hopefully a helpful message. Honestly, it's not helpful some of the time though. That's the thing you would copy paste into Google and hope for an answer. If that doesn't work, go to ChatGPT and hope that it gives you an answer. If that doesn't work, ask a friend. I don't know what you do. Uh, but you, it's in the context of the code. Just up from that, that's your actual code, the deepest line in your code where you are. Python programs, when they run, they use something called a stack and a stack frame. A function can call a function that calls a function. We can go as deep as we want. This is the deepest line in our code. If there were more lines above it, it would be going up the call stack there. So you read from the bottom up. The last line is the most important. So it's saying on line seven, this is a float. It's supposed to be an integer. How do we fix that? Yeah, we can wrap it in int. 
So range, it, it actually can't use floating point numbers. There's actually another way to solve this, though. In Python, there's a slash slash operator. I'm only going to show it off here because it, it exists, but you could just use int. It does integer division. That would have been another way to solve it. So we're breathing in, we're breathing out. Hopefully, it's only six seconds. Ooh, it's funny. It's Ah, it's printing things in groups, right? So we maybe should have done three-second pause, and then a three-second pause. So, oh, is it six each time? Ah, OK, then I probably should have divided this a little differently. I think I would have needed to do a divide by two there. Uh, you can play with this on your own. Something you might want to try if you do end up playing with this program, you could do something in between. You could say, let's print, for example, period, and then we'll sleep for one second, and then we'll print out period twice, and kind of make a little line that gets bigger and smaller as you go. So I'll show it here real quick with a, a slightly smaller line. You know, to signify you've, you're breathing in, you're breathing out, you can make this whatever you'd like here. Uh, we are about to eat lunch in two minutes, so I want to let you go so that you can actually eat. So I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, it has been a pleasure. If you have questions, I will stick around afterward as we eat. Feel free to ask. If this is your first PyCon, as I know it is for most of you, the newcomer's orientation tomorrow night, uh, I will be on stage along with some other folks. I recommend going there because you want to orient yourself to this conference that will be even scarier tomorrow as more and more people show up. Uh, if you would like stickers for a Python exercise service that I run where I do screencasts and exercises for Python morsels, I have them somewhere. I'll pass them out in the back of the room in just a moment here. Uh, have a great PyCon.